Hi, and welcome to the Vulcan Prize podcast, the podcast about linguistic discrimination. I'm Carrie Gillen. And I'm Megan Figueroa. And uh, we got people out there being racist again, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so shocked. <laughs> so, so shocked. Trump was uh, racist again when he was, what was it, like a press conference with a border patrol, a Latino border patrol agent? He delivered a speech in tribute to officers of Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Customs and Border Patrol, sorry, Border Protection. Right. Anyway, when he was uh, about to introduce him, uh, Trump says that he speaks perfect English. Is that right? Is that the correct quote? That is the correct quote. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we both know that the there is just so much more that's wrong with that besides the linguistic um, bit. Systemic issues and stuff and like ice and all this. But when we talk about linguistic discrimination, this is one of those things that's like equivalent to saying like, if you say that who when someone has a foreign accent and you say, oh, wow, you're really articulate or, you know, all these things where you're acting surprised that they can actually quote unquote speak well. <laughs> yeah. You're being a bit of a dick, right? So, well, yeah, and you're also being kind of you're being essentialist because you think that only certain people should be able to have the skills to speak English, but like, right, whatever language you speak has nothing to do with anything other than where you grew up or who your parents are or something like that. Like, you take a baby from one end of the uh, one end of the world, stick them in another part of the world, they're just going to grow up the language that they speak there, not where they came right, right. from. It's just, it's bizarre. People still have these really weird racial ideas about how language works. I don't know anything about this Border Patrol agent, except that he's Latino. Um, he might not even speak Spanish, right? It's possible, yeah. I have no idea. Yeah, but yeah, so just because you're Latino doesn't mean you speak Spanish, so you're... But even if you did, speaking Spanish right, right, has right. nothing to do with your ability to speak English. You can be bilingual. Right. It's, it's racializing the Spanish language, too. Yes. So that was a real dick move and of course no one's surprised that he would say something racist and xenophobic and no it was i'm sure it was on purpose too it's like hey look yeah yeah i like some latinos look at this guy and right. also i'm still gonna be racist while i say i like him so that the white supremacists know that i'm still a white supremacist right yep yeah he's one of the good latinos look at him he's in a border patrol agent uh uniform and yet still right right and still Bring him down a couple of pegs. <laughs> <sighs> Fun times. <laughs> and then there was a, another article a couple of days ago that was relevant to us. Yes. Always, I like to think, because I'm full of myself. <laughs> well, when it's specifically about women's voices, then obviously. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's a Mashable.com article from the 22nd of August. And it's called Stop Telling Women How They Should Talk. It's, it's as if, you know, we've probably said the exact same thing before. I am 100% certain we've said it at least one time. And it was by Rachel Thompson. They actually interview linguist uh, Lisa Davidson, mm -hmm. so that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's basically what we, we talked about in our very first episode. And they even talk about, like, we talked about the... Uh, lexicon valley episode where they talk about it and they talk about that they don't call out uh the people like we do but <laughs> it's okay <laughs> well i guess you didn't have the skills probably true true the very last line is what really needs to change isn't women's voices but how we think about women and their voices exactly exactly so that's definitely the moral of every episode Yes. <laughs> and just switch it out for women's when it's, you know. Right. I mean. The relevant group, depending on what we're talking about. But yeah. Ex exactly. And then the the culmination of all that is everyone. Right? <laughs> what really needs to change isn't everyone's voices, but how we think about everyone and their voices. <laughs> Although I would say, uh, I think women are picked on their voices more. So other other people are picked on for other things. Like, oh, you don't. You have bad grammar or your vocabulary is poor or whatever you know it's not usually about how your voice sounds like that seems to be pretty women-centric mm. and that's true and gay men probably yes but there's a connection there's there. definitely a connection <laughs> and one day we will talk about it with someone who has more authority on the subject yes yes we will get there the way people speak 
can be judged in many different ways, but it seems like voices is mainly about femininity. Yes, femininity, that's it. So, oh, good times. Heavy, heavy <laughs> sigh. I know, it's like a constant struggle. We're going to be fighting this forever, as we said a few episodes ago. It's just, it's, it's forever. Uphill battle. Yeah, but this is a hill I'm willing to die on. Sisyphusian battle. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to remember, I've got to think like advertisers. You just constantly got to say the same, same thing over and over again, and eventually people will come around. Speaking of... Patreon, y'all. <laughs> sort of. Right? Well, if we keep pe- reminding people that we have it. We're advertising ourselves. Yes. 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 We're advertising ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you can find us at patreon.com slash vocal fries pod. Basically everything we do online is vocal fries pod. <laughs> yeah. So if you're like, hmm, I wonder if they're using such and such a social media platform, look for vocal fries pod. Yeah, because the Twitter, the vocal fries was taken long, long ago. Yeah, it's fine. And here we are. It's yeah. <laughs> but if you like what we're doing, you can support us. Yeah. Remember, we're indie podcast, just trying to make the world a better place. <laughs> <laughs> One episode where we yell at you to not be an asshole at a time. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of today's episode, we get to talk about New Orleans. Yeah. <laughs> so that's fun. Yeah. It's a great city. And we were supposed to be it's there so great. a couple weekends ago, but that all fell through. So uh, we still ended up interviewing the person that we were going to interview um, at the live show, uh, Lisa Sprouse. So uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. We get to learn some new things about... New Orleans English. So today we have uh, a guest to talk about something we have never addressed. We're actually going to talk about uh, at least somewhat, we're going to talk about class for the first time. So I'm really excited. We hint at it. We hint, we go near it, and then we're like, whoop, we don't know enough. We don't know enough. (laughs) (laughs) So today we have Lisa Sprouse, who is a PhD candidate at Tulane. And her focus is on sociolinguistics and sociophonetics of American dialects in particular Montana, Pittsburgh, and New Orleans. And today we're going to focus on New Orleans. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so happy. I'm, again, about to learn everything (laughs) because I know nothing. Yeah, this is definitely an area that I know almost nothing about, like almost. So it'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. So um, where should we begin? Should we talk about Let's talk about what, what dialects exist in New Orleans. Yeah. Like, broadly speaking, there are probably lots, but... So, broadly speaking, with the dialects, it honestly depends on what year the research was done and who did the research. Ah, right. So, the general accepted right now is that if we're speaking narrowly, there are three, which would be a New Orleans-specific type of African-American English, the working-class white English which is called Yat, and then the upper class white English, which I refer to as Garden District English. That's the area of the city it's most closely related to. If we branch out, a lot of other people argue that there's five. The three that I mentioned, then also a type of just standard American English, which seems to be taking over some of the local dialects in the city. And there's also a discussion of whether or not there is a Creole English in New Orleans which would be the Creole African-American population in areas of the city like the Seventh Ward, that population is notoriously difficult to research. So there's not, there's honestly not too much work on any of the dialects except for Yat, which is very well established. So let's, let's begin with Yat then, since that's the best studied. So what is the Yat dialect? What features does it have? Who speaks it? Etc. So Yat, which comes from a greeting in New Orleans, where Yat. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. you blew my mind. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, so it doesn't, it doesn't actually refer to where are you, where are you at, like space wise. Um, It's actually unclear where that came from. There's a bunch of different theories. One that always shows up is that it's from musicians who would pass each other and say, where you at? As in, where are you playing tonight? Hmm. Which oh. then turned into, where you at? Um, would you like to guess what 
an appropriate response to where Yat is? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, wait. Uh, dang it. No. I have no idea. <laughs> so a pretty standard response would be something like, I'm good. Uh, okay. Not what I was going to okay. say. I was going to like say something like spatially. Definitely. Like, Yeah, it's um, space and class are very tricky yeah. in New Orleans. Um, but... So Yat yeah, is generally considered to be the working class white English dialect in the city. It would have started in traditional white working class neighborhoods like the Irish Channel, which is uptown closer to the river. Then other areas like the Ninth Ward, which is now predominantly African American, was working class white up until about the 1960s. Oh, okay. So that's where that dialect would have likely began. It is now found mostly outside of the city. Um, so Katie Carmichael has done a lot of work on Yat, showing that it is mainly in St. Bernard Parish, right? So we have parishes instead of counties in Louisiana. So St. Bernard Parish borders Orleans Parish. There are a few different neighborhoods, mainly ones called Chalmette and Araby, which are considered to now be the Yat homeland. So it has moved slightly outside of the city, and it is associated with to put it bluntly, it is associated with white flight, um, right. the movement of this dialect. So New Orleans very much fought against integration in the public school system. So this was the site of, uh, in 1960, Ruby Bridges, who integrated one of the schools in the city. And a lot of people withdrew their children and even moved outside of the city. So that's around the time that Yat moved into St. Bernard Parish. There's also the question of, is it actually distinct from African-American English? Right. That's a question that I wanted to get to for sure. So yeah, is it distinct from the African-American English variety spoken in New Orleans? So if we talk about the different features of African-American English and Yat, there's a lot of overlap between the two. Some of the standard features that are considered part of Yat would be that it's Arless. Post-vocalic Arlessness is still very common throughout Yat. It is receding through the generations. So example of that would be even the pronunciation of the pronunciation of New Orleans is often dialect specific. Um, so in Yat, you're likely to get either the R retained with uh, New Orleans or New Orleans. Mm. That's a common space of so that R is going to get dropped. Um, word finally, the ER suffix that R is going to get dropped on a lot of words. Better for better is a really common one. Even more common uh, proper nouns like. The month names, you're going to get October, November, right? So it's going to drop even in uh, more standardized situations. So then moving on, TH stopping, which is the replacement of your interdental fricatives, the orthographic TH with a T or a D. Probably the most famous example of this would be with the New Orleans Saints, who dat, uh. where instead of who that, you're getting who dat, or the whole phrase, who dat say they're going to beat them saints in that whole phrase. And that is a feature you're going to find in Yat at about the same level as you're going to find it in African American English in the city. Our listeners about the same, you're going to find that in both. There's a few older features that are very rare to find, but you do find them in both uh, black and white working class English in the city. We have what's called the coil curl reversal. So for example, uh, my advisor told me she was at a subway, I think, and she was carrying her son and the lady working behind the counter told her not to spurl her child instead of spoil oh wow we, when we when we went to uh new orleans a few years ago megan and i the first thing that we encountered was this actually yes in the someone airport at, someone right yeah someone at the airport told us it's cooking earl yeah <laughs> like she went out of her way to explain yeah i love <laughs> which it. i loved yeah yeah because <laughs> i think i asked her how to pronounce new orleans properly well you know pro quote unquote properly like now that i'm in new orleans how do i say it you know and then she went on to tell us uh -huh. about that and it was perfect i loved it <laughs> yeah yeah so that is it's a little older but that's a feature that both white and black speakers tend to be aware of and they will talk about it not so much if they use it if they use it they're not really got right the level of conscious awareness of using it is slightly lower yeah but talking about it in a metalinguistic sense is very high um i interviewed an older woman um she was in her 90s and she was talking but she didn't use it at all but she was talking about her mother um would always say that she was going to buy her a new scoit to wear to school oh wow, wow. Right? Yeah. Or my neighbor 
does it, he was telling me about working on his car. He apologized for there being an oral spill on the driveway next door whenever he was changing the oil in his car. It's a prevalent feature. It is on the decline, but um, you still do hear people use it, and it's used in a performative way as well. And to throw a little more complication into this, all of those features that you find in both Yat and African American English, you also find in New York City. Oh, um, that's okay. true. Yeah, 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 yeah. That. And other port cities, um, Savannah and Charleston, it is re- receding there. Uh, you'll find some of that there. Interesting. Yat also has the split short A system of New York City English. Can you explain that? Split short A refers to how, for most dialects, the vowel phoneme found in the word cat is pronounced relatively stable in quality across all speakers and all um, environments in a dialect. A split short A system refers to a tensing that usually occurs before voiced and nasal sounds. So, for example, with... um, a voiceless P, and for example, map, you'd get that standard A sound map, but mad, you would get a tensing raising of the vowel to mad. Oh, Woo! yeah. Woo! Fun. Yes. I love that sound. So you get that, <laughs> yes, you get that in Yat um, in New Orleans, which is not a Southern feature. It is not wow. really an African American English feature. So there's a the question of why that feature has popped up in New Orleans. Do you know why? Or is it an open question? It is an open question. Um, I've previously done some research trying to kind of postulating why YAT has the features that it does. There is a pretty strong trend going through current research that it may have to do with the time of settlement by immigrant groups that are coming through port cities. Okay. The theory that we're running is that it has to do with Italian, but maybe more specifically Sicilian immigration through port cities Mm -hmm. is a pretty strong commonality between New York city and New Orleans. New Orleans was the largest port of immigration South of New York at the, throughout the 1800s. Right. A lot of people coming through. We've done some research about 70 miles Northwest of the city. Yeah. It doesn't really show up between New Orleans and the communities in that, in that expanse. But we get to this little town called Independence, about 70 miles northwest, where a lot of the Sicilian immigrants who came into New Orleans were ter- were told to go to Independence because there was farming land there. Right. And they are consistently showing these yacht features. Interesting. Yeah. So that, that's one clue that that may be where it's coming from. Other people have floated some theories that um, in the Reconstruction era following the Civil War, there were businessmen from New York City who came to New Orleans um, to try to, you know, do some economic profiting. But that doesn't explain why the rest of the South doesn't have it. Right. Right. Is, is there something about the variety of Italian spoken in Sicily that would lead to this change or, or I mean, this distinction? Not with that specific feature. There are some vowel differences between standard Italian and what is considered Sicilian. And Sicilian is either a dialect or a separate language, depending on what source you're reading as well. Right, of course. (laughs) But with that tensing, there doesn't really seem to be a motivation for that happening. It's interesting. I mean, it it seems like you're... It seems like it's it's plausible that it's coming from this this particular group of people, but then the language (laughs) facts don't line up. But anyway, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's probably going to be our common trend today with New Orleans. Yeah. <laughs> this, this might be why it's happening, but we're not exactly sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good because people should realize that this is how science works. So we don't always have the answers yeah. yet. <laughs> we're following the evidence, but <laughs> we don't we, know. We might not be there yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eventually, mm-hmm. hopefully, but yeah. maybe not now. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, let's go back to um, the Yat African American English uh, difference, which seems to be small if, if, if it exists. So are there any actual differences or? Yes, culturally, there are a lot sure. of differences, especially after a lot of the Yats move to St. Bernard. Um, but for the longest time, the Ninth Ward would have been white and black 
right, on the same block. Even now, if you go into the Ninth Ward, there are both white and black communities, but it really varies by block. New Orleans is, by and large, still um, culturally and geographically segregated. I think that's kind of the case for most cities in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. New Orleans is about 63% African American, uh, so an overwhelming majority, but more concentrated in specific areas of the city. I would venture the guess that the reason they shared a lot of the commonalities would have been initially because of geographic space and not necessarily cultural connectedness between the two groups, especially if you look at some other research where Yat speakers are very insistent that the dialect they speak is very markedly different than African American English. I mean, it makes sense that they want to demarcate themselves because, yeah, that's what people do. But it's interesting that there's not much of a difference. Right. Could they tell the difference? Can they tell the difference between themselves and the other group? (laughs) Uh, Not very well. Uh, Yeah. So we've done some research on this, um, looking at different verbal guys and map labeling tasks and then seeing if... uh, respondent race factored into how they're labeling or perceiving speech in the city. Right. So we did do a verbal guise task where we recorded nine different New Orleanians all um, speaking the same sentence. And they were from different areas of the city, either black or white, different ages. Most had some college education, a few only finished high school. But our focus was, can listeners really demarcate race with any level of above chance, really. And so we had, when we did this a few years ago, I think we had 49 people that responded to this, that listened to it. And of the nine recordings, we had seven were of white speakers. We had two that were African-American English speakers. And that was on purpose? It wasn't necessarily on purpose that way, but it's just the willingness, the willingness of people to either participate as a speaker or a listener. Okay. So for these white speakers that we had up through middle age of these speakers up to about 50, both our black and our white respondents could identify race correctly between 89 and 100% of the time. So of most of the white speakers, they were way above chance in identifying that these were white speakers. But then our two oldest white speakers, so we had a 78 year old who was from the upper class white dialect And then we had an 85-year-old that was from Chalmette, so the Yat working class. Two, as we would think, very distinct white dialects. The racial identification for these speakers was basically a chance for both black and white respondents, um, ranging really anywhere between about 44 and 51% correct racial identification of these speakers. That may clue us into the fact that African-American English and the white dialects in the city used to be a lot more similar than they are now. I see. Um, Okay. It is likely that when race and class really started to diverge more in the city about 50 years ago, that the dialects similarly diverged from each other. We didn't look too much at the class with the specific one, but we did find that within the race that matched their own, right? So with the black respondents listening to the two black speakers, they could tell you class, right? They, they, they were much better than white speakers, just like with our seven white speakers, the white respondents were much better at delineating. Well, this person probably is working class, maybe finished high school. This person has a college degree. So for both races, age is what confuses people within your own race in new Orleans. It seems that class delineation is a lot easier to figure out so there are those little nuances with race and class that we're seeing with this something else interesting that came up with that if we switch to our two black speakers we had a 33 year old female and a 67 year old female the younger speaker very much confused all the respondents our white respondents um could identify her race 39 percent of the time and our black respondents could only do it 22 percent of the time oh Wow. What we had with her, she um, she had gone to graduate school, so her socioeconomic class and her education was higher than most of the other white speakers, so that really seemed to throw people off. That's fascinating. Yeah. Our older black speaker, who was considered more working class, our white respondents identified her race correctly 71% of the time, and black respondents had 100%. Right. Huh. So there's all these different nuances, and then 
when people said that they couldn't tell the race, it was interesting that often, instead of just saying they didn't know what race the speaker was, they identified the speaker as being Creole. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, which wouldn't really work in cities outside of New Orleans. No. In this kind of task, the I don't know equivalent in other cities is we're thinking the kind of the equivalent of saying that someone is Creole in these audio ma- in these audio guises because throughout the 300 years of the city, yes, the, the meaning of Creole has shifted multiple times and there's questions of ownership over what group is Creole, but at its base, someone that's Creole is of mixed race origin. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's kind of a catch-all for this. Interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah, so if they can't tell, they're like, okay, they're biracial. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, they're trying to cover their bases and including both. (laughs) And that's basically saying that they have influence from both dialects, or from both kind of speakers, right? So the the, the yeah yeah in in the African-American. Okay, that's really interesting. Yeah. But is there also a separate, or was there ever a separate um, dialect associated with Creole people or no? Likely there was and may still be. So very briefly, because a discussion of Creole could be a whole semester class. To start with, Creole referred to um, slaves born in Louisiana. So and then it shifted to just meaning born in Louisiana. So both slaves and the European immigrants who then had children here, their children were considered Creole. Oh, okay. After the U.S. took over, which had stricter race laws than the Spanish and French who ruled Louisiana before, um, Creole then took on the meaning of being mixed race. It shifted again since then, where we still have people that say they're white Creole versus black Creole. Oh. Hmm. Linguistically, if we're talking about Creole English, we are associating it with uh, Creole blacks, the African-American mixed population in the city. The issue with this that we've encountered is I've heard from other researchers that getting people to self-identify as Creole is the large barrier to studying Creole English. Why is that? There's a tendency with a white researcher that people who are from these Creole areas will just identify as black because that is enough of a racial distinction when you're talking to a white researcher. Right. Uh, My advisor tried it. She took a black undergraduate student with her and then someone who had previously identified as black to her um i believe identified as creole to Uh. the black student even if you you're pretty sure that someone is creole if they're not going to label themselves as creole there's you know there's an ethic issue with that of can you include them in a study of creole english so it's really the access to the population there are a few creole researchers uh mona lisa saloy who is at dillard university has done some preliminary work of listing out these are some lexical features of Creole English, suggesting that there is a Creole English, um, but there hasn't been any in-depth study of the population. Creole is also complicated. If I'm not sure if you guys are aware of the group that calls themselves the Mardi Gras Indians. No. no. Okay, so Mardi Gras Indians, I would recommend look it up. It's fantastic. Um, Mardi Gras Indians are a population within New Orleans that claim to be the descendants of slaves who took refuge with indigenous populations around New Orleans. Uh-huh. It falls under the umbrella term of Creole, but it's considered a separate group because it's not the white-black mixing that you normally associate with Creole. They trace their heritage to black and indigenous groups. Right. So that would be another group. They're very well known during Mardi Gras. They, as a tr- kind of as a tribute to these indigenous roots, they make these very lavish almost Plains Indian style costumes and they parade in their crews throughout the city. They, you know, they, they have their chants. They have some songs where the language that they're using is, is unknown, right? They're not even sure of what it is. Um, People have tried to study the Mardi Gras Indian chants. People have come up with theories that it's Choctaw or that it's Mobilian jargon, or even that it's um, just a variety of Creole French. Oh. Right, so hmm. that's another complication of are you considering your Mardi Gras Indian population as a Creole population? Are you looking at them separately, right? So right. race is not, 
it's not really clear cut for any population, but in New Orleans especially, for a city that if you look at the demographics and it says, well, it's 63% black, but then you have your different nuances within this population of who considers themselves to be African American, who considers themselves to be Creole, who doesn't think that there's a difference, right? So it's a it's a very um, complicated topic to look at. Yeah, and I think that's important for our listeners to when we like say we're talking about one geographic region it is so complicated we're not going to even like be able to get you know it's just like the tip of the iceberg kind of thing where like it depends on who you're talking to you know like there's so many different factors that you can talk about in one geographic region that it's like we're only we're only talking about one bit and there's so much more and we don't mean to exclude it right but it's like you can only do so much in one episode (laughs) yeah right exactly so um, now I want to talk about, um, what was it called? The Garden District dialect? The Garden District, yes. We know that class, especially amongst the white population in New Orleans, is pretty strictly delineated um, between the upper class and the working class in New Orleans. I guess kind of to move back a little bit, a lot of the media representations of New Orleans use a very exaggerated Southern drawl or even a Charleston type accent so i'm looking at you scott bacula from ncas new orleans <laughs> it's, it's not right it's it's like a it's like a tourist coming to new orleans and expecting people to speak french it's it's not really what the city is anymore but any notion of southernness is likely tied to upper class english in the city so this is what i'm doing my dissertation on right now all of this previous research has said there is an upper class white english but no one has studied it no one has labeled it as such there's a chance that there was a study done in the early 1950s by george reinecke where he made a map of adults that he interviewed and it labeled it seemed to correlate with upper class areas the garden district um, an area called esplanade ridge uptown near Tulane and Loyola universities, but he didn't call it upper class English. He didn't call it garden district English. He said that it was the English that was acceptable as the standard pronunciation in the city, Mm -hmm. which is another big shift because um, it is not anymore, right? Usually if you ask people, they will say that African-American English or yat slash Brooklyn sounding English is what's authentically New Orleans. So we have this dialect that we know exists It may have been considered the standard at one point. It definitely is not now. We're pretty confident that it's socioeconomically, it's the highly educated, um, richer populations in the city that speak it, but no one has really established what it is. Kind of going off anecdotal evidence, we had people label different areas of the city on a map task, and very consistently, the uptown and garden district areas by both black and white speakers were being labeled pretty equally as Southern and proper. Hmm. So that kind of clued us into, right? And so I am a socio-phonetician. My focus is the phonetics of these different dialects. So that's the angle I'm working on. I created the diff- I created the sociolinguistic interview with the different careful and casual prompts, focusing on both general Southern features, uh, right? The different monophthongs that you get out of the diphthongs, some aspects of the Southern vowel shift, the pin-pen merger, um, is a big as- is a big part of that that we're focusing on. Other southern features like the Rlessness, and I'm also including older southern features that you get in areas like Charleston and somewhat in Savannah. Things like the WWH distinction, where you get weather but weather. Two pronunciations of horse, which is very hard for me to do. So H O R S E is horse. And H O A R S E is horse. Interesting. Traditionally, in oh. some of these older dialects. So I'm targeting some of these older features, these traditional, new, almost what's considered standard Southern, right? Along a lot of the features of the Southern vowel shift. But then I'm also including on my list of features to look at these yat features, right? So um, the TH stopping, the coil curl issue, the split short A system to try to see what is showing up amongst these upper class speakers. So in the research that I've done so far, doing the phonetic analysis, I'm pretty sure that if we put these people into a verbal guise with other general Southern areas, people would just identify these upper class New Orleanians as speaking a Southern English. 
Right. All the speakers that I've talked to so far have very high levels of artlessness. It's higher than what I've seen in the previous research I've done on YAT. Right. So it seems to be a retention amongst this social class that is receding in the other um, classes in the city. That WWH distinction, all of the speakers that I've talked to have that. The two versions of horse, a lot of the speakers have that. And then some unexpected features that I wasn't even sure. A distinction in H, where um, H-I-M and H-Y-M-N are not pronounced the same. They're not both him. Oh. Um, oh. There's like a... There's this odd voicing happening on the H, so that there are a minimal pair. Well, which one's which? So H-I-M is him, and then H-Y-M-N, there's a different voice. It's like him. Oh. There's almost like a pre-voicing huh. going on with a little bit of that. Some other standard Southern features, the I monophthongization is very high amongst the group that I'm looking at. Um, some other Southern features which doesn't get talked a lot about with Southern English is the replacement of word final E with an I or a schwa. So happy for happy ah. is happening a lot. I even had a participant whose last, whose first name ended with an E and he doesn't pronounce it. Right. Even though that is considered the more standard way of pronouncing the name, um, he substitutes the schwa in his own name. That's cool. Wow. So if we just stop there, it does just seem like it's these southern features. The split short A system is showing up. The TH stopping is not with the speakers. And I'm looking, my current age range of speakers is between 20 and 95. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. None of them really have the TH stopping that we're getting in the YAT and the African-American English. But that split short A that's showing up in the YAT system is showing up to a lesser degree. It seems to only be before nasal sounds. So map and mad are the same, but man oh. or man. So it seems to be a little more restricted in this group. Um, and, and a short A system is not something that we find in Southern English. No, it's not considered a feature of Southern English. That is, It is very largely stereotyped as a New York City feature. Um, and to an extent, a Midwestern feature, but on specific words like uh, "biag." Yeah. Okay. Is that because because of the velar? Yeah. So that is it's somewhat different that velar raising. So we do see it more isolated in the Midwest. But yeah, the the, the stereotypical association has never been with the South for a feature like this. But to me, what's a little more interesting, so if we take it to the more socio element of sociophonetic, is the speakers are largely rejecting a Southern association with their own speech. Are they giving reasons for this? Or Yep. <laughs> New Orleanians are very opinionated. Um, <laughs> it's been, I would say it's both, it's it's a blessing to study in New Orleans because people are always going to respond. You never know what they're going to say, um, but they're usually always going to give you a reason. There's a few different things where the most recent person I talked to kept making this distinction of at first he was saying, no, I don't sound Southern. But then he was saying, okay, if I do sound Southern, I sound high Southern. Ooh, That's not a terminology that I really come across as being a standard thing to talk about. He explained it to me. He's like, well, he was like, high Southern is plantation South. It's upper class South. So, right. So there's a class element coming in here with what is southern if they are southern we're the upper class south i had another respondent who is he was one of my older ones he's 96 um i believe you know i avoid asking people directly are you southern because that's you know it's a blunt priming effect but i asked them is there southern english in new orleans is new orleans southern going along with the other respondent who said that if it is it's high southern he said no he said southern is salt of the earth people He said, Southern is what you get when you go to the farms outside of New Orleans. So there is, there's this trend coming through that there's an incompatibility between being upper class and being Southern. Mm -hmm. Wow. Even if the phonetic evidence that I'm getting from these interviews is that on paper, they are very noticeably Southern Mm -hmm. in their speech that doesn't match the perception that they have of themselves working class white and black speakers in the city have the perception that they are Southern, as we saw in the maps that they labeled, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Garden district, Southern, Southern, Uptown, Southern, 
near the universities proper and southern but the actual people that live in these areas are rejecting this association so apart from the, the class difference they also tend to differentiate geographic space within the south so i had a respondent tell me that she went to arkansas and tennessee with her family when she was younger this would have been in like the 1950s and she said they sounded like yokels she said they sounded like yokels and that she couldn't understand what they were saying the same respondent who told me that if he's southern he's high southern said that people always mimic his dialect but he said that when he hears it it sounds like they're mimicking like a coal miner from like kentucky or tennessee which the association i'm getting from being a linguist and also right i'm originally from pittsburgh so i'm from northern appalachia is that with these states that they're identifying, they're also kind of pinpointing the Appalachian South as being very markedly different than the South near New Orleans. If they are Southern, they are definitely the upper class Southern, and they are definitely not Appalachian Southern. We talked to um, Paul Reed about Appalachia English, and yeah, it's <laughs> it's the most Southern of the Southern. Um, yeah, that's what we discovered. So yeah, right. And so these these people are performing a li- they're they're um, committing a little linguistic discrimination. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, just a little, you know. We all do. So <laughs> just sprinkle it on there. <laughs> yeah. So not only with with southern and with class, but when race comes into the conversation with these um, garden district speakers, there's what I'm currently referring to as an othering of Black New Orleans. It is at its core linguistic discrimination, but there's the question of, do these speakers actually see that that's what it is, right? To them, it may be that they're saying something benign, that what they're saying may just be an observation about race, when it actually comes off as being pretty discriminatory in what they're saying. Um, So I had a participant who, you know, spent all of his formative years in the Garden District area of the city, went to the private schools in the area and told me that, you know, when he was in school, he was surprised to learn that the black kids across town could read and write too. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's just the geographic space in the city did not overlap Mm -hmm. right for black and white for him. And it was almost like a shock that they could do the same things. It's brutal. It's brutal. Yeah. But you know, it didn't, it was just a casual thing for him to say, right. He kind of said it with a little laugh and I don't, it wasn't in a mean way. And he was older, an older? Yeah, he was an older speaker. Yeah, so to him, it was just a recollection, a recollection from his youth. There, I don't think that there was anything in his mind negative associated with it, right? But linguistic discrimination is something that, you know, people honestly may not be aware that they're doing, or they're likely not going to admit, right? Right. They're, they're not going to admit that they're taking part in that. Right. Yeah. If they're conscious of their discrimination of this uh, at this level, they kind of push it aside or they aren't conscious of it at all they just think it's a normal thing to say like they just they, it's never occurred to them that what they're saying <laughs> is actually says something bad about themselves because they wouldn't say it i don't think they would say it if they knew that yeah so if i can shift for a minute and talk about another study we did that we can talk about these the discrimination coming into play around the same time we did the verbal guys we did a map labeling task and it was during the spring of 2016 spring is carnival so we went to different parades and we went to parades on mardi gras day and while people were waiting for the parades to come through uh we would approach different people and ask them if they wanted to fill out a map so we asked people to label distinct speech areas of the city or where they thought people sounded differently than they did we had 88 people that responded. About 50% of them were white, 38% were black, uh, 12 identified other. As is kind of the case with map tasks, a lot of people will just leave them blank. A lot of people only labeled one area, and they labeled Chalmette right outside of the city, and they labeled it as Yat. Really no further delineation of their thoughts on class or race, but in labeling it Yat, it does kind of indicate that they're saying this is a white area. But there's really nothing inherently negative about that label. So here's an example of some descriptions we got on a map labeled by a white speaker. They circled five areas. They circled Araby and Chalmette and St. Bernard Parish and just labeled it as Yat. They circled the Garden District and put soft R's 
<laughs> almost like saying that the garden district is artless. Mm -hmm. So those three, those are three white areas. Really nothing discriminatory coming out in that. But then they circled an area of the city called Central City, which is almost an exclusively black neighborhood. They labeled it as ghetto. Mm. And then they circled the ninth ward and wrote Ebonics. Oh my god. Yes. Oh. Uh... I, I, okay, so obviously both of those labels are problematic, but like the fact that they're distinguishing between them too, is there anything there? Like why are they making a distinction? That is a good question. I would guess off the labeling that in their head, ghetto is less proper than whatever they think Ebonics is. Oh, okay. That, that makes sense. Yeah. The central city overall is, it's one of the more dangerous areas of the city, so that may come into play there, right? But it is overwhelmingly black, just like the Ninth Ward is. But yeah, the question of why is the Ninth Ward just abonics, which is offensive in and of itself. Yes, right. yes, yes. But then to shift to something as extreme as ghetto yeah. for right. another black area, um, or other things like, so I live in an area of the city called Gentilly, which is predominantly black. Another map circled Gentilly and just wrote dumb. <gasps> on it no oh my god yes the same map the only other area they circled was the ninth ward and it said ignorant but they wrote it in like i dialect and wrote ignorant oh. right so a further level of offense apart from just calling these people ignorant to try to mimic it in the way they think people talk in that area That's oh my horrifying. god i should not be shocked i should not be shocked but i i still am a little right and just how openly people are willing to label these and be yeah. like yeah you can like you can identify me by name. Here's my <laughs> offensive map. And I'm like, uh, oh, no, thank you. Wow. But if we look at the general trends, apart from just some of the specific maps, of the different areas that people labeled, the trend was for white speakers to label white neighborhoods and for black speakers to label black areas. So the overall trend was to just, honestly, to identify the areas that you know. But then if we shift to identifying the areas you don't know, that's when the white respondents came in with these discriminatory judgments of the black areas right right the ghetto and the abonics interestingly a lot of black respondents just told us that everyone in the city speaks the same mm -hmm. huh. one white speaker said that but it was much more common amongst the black speakers to say everyone in the city speaks the same that's interesting and then if we look at some of these specific areas right so we made heat maps of these different labels uptown which again is the garden district the most common label amongst white speakers was standard, and the most common label amongst black speakers was proper. Pretty similar in the association of what this is. Lakeview, which is another upper class area, the one of the most common words for both races was proper. So we're getting with these white neighborhoods, both races are giving a pretty neutral or even what could be considered a, a positive association of how people talk in these areas. But if we look at some of the black neighborhoods, so again, the Ninth Ward, the most common label from black speakers was black English. Abonics was the most common from a white speaker, right? So if you can call something African American English or black English, you're making a conscious choice to then call it Ebonics instead. Right. Oh, yeah. It, it's a very conscious choice to do that. And then we have New Orleans East, which is another black area. Black respondents tend to call it blue collar or just black. Two of the most common resp responses from white labels was lack of education and ghetto. I should not be so shocked, but again, it's just, like, horrifying. Right, so I said before, right, it's it's a blessing to do research in New Orleans. It's it's also very discouraging at times. Right. I mean, it's it almost seems like there, it's hopeless. Like, oh, that feels so hopeless. <laughs> yeah. But, see. But, but it also <laughs> feels like this microcosm of what's going on in the United States right now, right? Like, That's yeah. what I mean. That's why it feels hopeless. <laughs> it's like Yeah, yes. I mean, yes, it is hopeless. But, well, you could interpret it that way. But I think, like, seeing the reality of, like, how shitty white people can be is important. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, sure. The new complication we're getting with that, right, so more of just the cultural, is um, New Orleans has taken down a lot of Confederate I don't even want to call them monuments because it's right. but monuments, right? So they've taken down a lot of them. And that has led to, it's not even people really in New Orleans that are upset about this, but we're getting a lot of protesters coming in from other areas of Louisiana and other areas of the South that now all of a sudden want to claim New Orleans as being very Southern. Yeah. Whereas before they ignored it. Yeah. So a good thing, the label I go with is um Nick Spitzer who's an anthropologist in the city, once told me that New Orleans is south of the south and north of the Caribbean. Yeah, mm. that that's a good description. 
right? Yeah. So it's never really culturally or linguistically really been considered part of the South. But then when people want to take away any of those Southern relics, they want to claim it as the South. They want it to be the South again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there, we are getting a little bit of that resurgence in the city right now. Um, it's still unclear if there's really an effect on the language or the culture in the city right now. You might expect that the white speakers would want to disambiguate themselves even more uh, from black speakers. That's what my, what I would predict. Kind of like, so in our music episode, we were talking about how different genres are associated with, you know, different varieties of American English. And um, this, the country music has becoming really are full because it's like really really white <laughs> mm -hmm. i mean that would be super interesting to look at in new orleans because mm -hmm. you know yeah. new orleans has its own right it, even within hip-hop and rap are largely associated with new orleans but there's a new orleans specific genre right bounce music is very yeah. specifically new orleans right so big frida Yeah. Yes. We tried to get Big Frida on the show. <laughs> it didn't work, but maybe I'll dreams. try again. <laughs> that that would have been fascinating. Uh, yes. Very, very nice person. Um, yes. But right, so even within the music in New Orleans, right, the language is showing through, right? So call and response in rap music largely comes from bounce music, which comes from New Orleans. That call and response likely comes from either the Mardi Gras Indians or the fact that New Orleans was such an African city when it was founded. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So the language is coming through and music in New Orleans as well. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I could, we could do a whole nother show just on that stuff. And I would love that. Maybe, maybe we will at some point. What would um, upper class um, African-Americans say they speak? I, I myself haven't done too much with African-American English in the city. From some of the stuff I've read and some of the researchers I've talked to, there is a little bit of a trend amongst the upper class African-American speakers in the city to trend a little more towards a standard English, right? So it doesn't really trend towards Southern as the upper class white English does a little more towards standard. That's interesting. It kind of makes sense that that might be the case. It'd be interesting yeah. to see. Yeah, the, the class distinctions amongst the black population in the city has not been studied to the extent that it really deserves right right so what i'm working on right now is really the one of the first really like class-based associations a lot of the previous work on yat is inherently class-based as well but it bleeds a little more into a race-based analysis um while the garden district english uh lends itself a little more to a class association so do you have like a a last message for our listeners a takeaway a takeaway you know, without trying to, like, wax poetic or anything, New Orleans really is unlike any other culture or linguistic area that I've encountered, right? There's just something that, it is just uniquely New Orleans, and I would say people should experience it. And maybe my really last takeaway is that if you are going to visit or you are going to study, that please never pronounce it New Orleans. <laughs> wow. New Orleans is only for Louis Armstrong when he's singing, right? That's <laughs> We don't call it that. Do you know what it means to miss New Orleans and miss it each night? I think that would be the easiest takeaway, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I, I like that. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again. That was that was awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I I would say my takeaway from this is just that you have to <laughs> go visit for sure. Like everything you're saying to me, I was like. Just like thinking about my time there and how wonderful it was. Yeah, so. I want to go back. <laughs> we were supposed to be there this weekend, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. The weather is really not that nice right now, so you're not... No, it's... Yeah. yeah. It's not that great here either, though, so... <laughs> I, I, I tried. Yeah. You know, I tried it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> On this one specific weekend, New Orleans is just terrible. You don't, you don't want to visit. All right. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay well thank you so much lisa yeah, thank you and uh don't forget don't be an asshole <laughs> don't be an asshole <laughs> bye. bye the vocal fries podcast is produced by chris ayers for half tone audio theme music by nick granham you can find us on tumblr twitter facebook and instagram at vocal fries pod you can email us at vocalfriespod at gmail.com. <laughs>